smooth transition. Dennis, if, if you could move your panel towards the stage. Um, the, uh, Secretary Vilsack mentioned the challenge of climate change that is going to make our job feeding the world uh, and feeding the world nutritiously more challenging. And I, I put it that way because uh, um, there's new evidence emerging that climate change not only reduces the availability of food, but it also can reduce the micronutrient profile of key food crops, uh, such as major grains. And as Secretary Vilsack mentioned, there are a lot of people in the world, a lot of governments, international institutions and organizations that are determined to do something about it. And there's been a, a, an effort that uh, uh, Secretary Vilsack's team has spearheaded, now joined by a broad interagency team across the U.S. government, uh, working with partners around the world to develop an alliance for climate smart agriculture. Uh, recently, <coughs> earlier this month, the U.N. Secretary General gave a clear endorsement of that effort, and he's repeated it twice since then already. Um, this is a, an effort that is taking up momentum. We're going to hear more about it from the panel that's about to, to speak, um, but uh, uh, it really is a, 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 an array of countries that's very impressive. It includes countries like South Africa, Vietnam, the Netherlands, Nigeria, Norway, and many others. International institutions like the World Bank that's represented here, uh, the CG system uh, in its, uh, its climate change, agriculture, and food security cross uh, uh, institution consortium uh, that, uh, that's um, known as CCAFs, supporting it, the FAO, the, the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Um, and we're going to hear more, I think, especially from Dennis, but perhaps other panelists as well, about the uh, really pathbreaking work that's going on in Africa as well, where uh, in this year of agriculture, as, as uh, Minister Kalabata mentioned, African uh, governments and regional organizations are showing, uh, showing extraordinary leadership in this fight against climate change while we work to improve productivity and resilience. And so uh, to tell us more about this and to tell us more about the, the efforts uh, globally and regionally, um, we're the, we've got a panel that's uh, being led very ably by Dennis Garrity, uh, who um, is an expert in natural resources management and he supports grassroots, community-based natural resource management efforts in particular. He's the former executive director of the World Agroforestry Center, and he currently serves as the UN Drylands Ambassador. Welcome, Dr. Garrity and your panelists. <clears throat> well, thank you, Jonathan, and good afternoon, everyone. And of course, thanks to Secretary Vilsack for being the teaser this afternoon and setting the stage for the main act. <laughs> Not to speak of providing us with a full house. Well, indeed, we're going to focus this discussion on getting smart about change, climate change and agricultural change. And we'll be honing in on three big questions. First of all, what do we know about the impacts and implications of climate change on the future of agriculture in the developing world? Second, what is coming up in terms of innovative, practical working alliances to promote a more climate smart agriculture in the coming years? And third, what are some of the most innovative practices to enhance productivity and resilience of smallholders uh, building on the new USAID resilience strategy and others. Our session will play out in two parts. First, we'll be asking our panel members to share their views on one or more of these questions. And then we'll be launching into some audience participation with uh, some give and take with the panel. Although Secretary Vilsack did cut in a bit to our time, so that may be a bit limited uh, after all. But anyway, jot down your queries so that we can do that um, a little later in the program. Well, let's get started. Dr. Molly Brown of NASA will be setting the stage for us, followed by Mark Sadler from the World Bank, then Jerry Glover from AID, and I will wind things up. Well, Molly, you are a geographer in the bios uh, biospheric sciences at NASA, and you've worked for about 15 years on trying to understand the drivers of agricultural change. You also have credentials 
as a former Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal, which I understand really goes well with this crowd here. Um, so what is your latest assessment of the impacts and prognosis for climate change? Let me go grab me. So um, I, I really appreciate that having the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, I, you know, I wanted to uh, just, I was been asked to lay out the big picture. And as you all know, the number of people in the world is going up. And we have um, significant increases in livestock cons consumption, a changing diet. Everyone in India and China who have the resources want to eat, you know, bacon and eggs for breakfast and steak for dinner like us in the modern world. And this will have significant impact on our ability to feed everyone. Um, the, we ha there's an increasing threat to the supply of food around the world. I'm sure you've all seen these. The, 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 in, the temperature image shows the increase of the observed change in surface temperature from 1901 to 2012 from the latest IPCC report. And you can see that there are significant areas at one and a half degrees, and the purple areas are at two and a half degrees change. And these are observations. This is not from a model. And on the right, or yeah, on, on, on the right, the precipitation shows the change from 1951 to 2010 from just one uh, rainfall data set showing increases in intensity, but also there are places with declines in rainfall. And again, observations. These mean changes will come with increasing variability around the mean. So the extreme events will become more significant in changes in production. And then we have a very diff large difference in low and high income countries and their vulnerabilities to these extreme events. Not everyone has the same ability to cope with extreme. We may see very large changes in the ability of agriculture to adapt to these changes in climate. This is a model which shows the potential changes to 2050 in yields, mostly due to increases in temperature. High in food prices, changes in the commodity markets is a big deal, right? And the question is, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? It depends on who you are and whether or not you're able to produce enough food for the whole year. If you are only able to produce 80% of your own food, that last 20% might put you in debt, reducing your ability to produce more food in the next year. Changes in the international prices drive what's going on in local areas. And so the red line shows the, the a food index from Maradi, Niger, and it shows that there are some responses, but it's not very correlated with the international prices, but prices are going up in those regions too. So what, how we need a lot more understanding of what the impact of changes in the commodity markets are. Poverty remains a major driver of impacts on outcome. These red circles show the percent of the average household income spent on food. Niger, again, 63% on average. United States, 6%. Incidentally, France, 15. <laughs> you know, they eat a lot better than we do, and they prioritize food more than we do, right? But, you know, this is a huge issue of poverty. So if you already spend a very large proportion of your income on food and food prices go up over short periods, you just, you get to 100% and you're done. You just don't consume enough to feed everyone. And then we see very large changes in actual rainfall over time. This figure is from the Famine Early Warning Systems Network, and it shows observations of, of um, rainfall in Kenya. And you can see that the um, yellow areas are observed rainfall in 1960 to 1989. The brown areas are 1990 to 2009. And the orange areas are predicted 2010 to 2039. And you can see this shrinking of the most productive regions in Kenya in the crop surplus zone, the zone that feeds the rest of the country, the zone with highly productive agriculture, the driver of the agricultural economy in this region. If this is the future, we need to adapt now. We need to understand how we can change to respond. And there's 
in these five countries in East Africa, or in Africa, I should say, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, we can see a growing gap between the investment in agricultural productive resources, cropped area, seeds, and fertilizer use the, in general, and the population. Now this is, um, goes up into um, 2005, so things have really changed since then. These programs that Secretary Vilsack has been talking about has really affected our ability to invest in these areas. But we need to do more in order to address the, the increasing number of people who, have, who are pulling from the international commodity markets. And my number is 70%. I think we need to increase food production by 70%, right? And the reason for that is that includes also a change in diet for the middle class. I want to feed people who are now eating too little. I want to invest in and transform the agricultural sector across many areas. So I think we need to increase food production by 70%. But, you know, I'll take 50%. <laughs> you know. Anyway, so that's all I have to say. Um, uh, NASA is spending a huge amount of effort having really good observational data sets which will drive these kinds of observations into the future. Thank you, Molly. And you know, that um, figure from Kenya just really strikes me dramatically as a native of the States, but living in Kenya for many years, that looks dire and uh, what, a, what, a, what a picture that's unfolding. Well, turning now to Mark Sadler. Mark uh, is a practice leader at the World Bank. Um, and manages the team on catalyzing climate action and the uh, agricultural risk management team as well. Mark, we look forward to your thoughts on the development of a new global institutional innovation to accelerate progress in moving the world towards a climate smart agriculture. Mark? Well, thank you, Dennis, and thank you for the in invitation to come today. Um, when I actually sent in my slides, there was a panic from the organizers a couple of hours ago. They said, my God, your slides are exactly the same as Molly's. Yes, I like it. <laughs> I take two things away from that. One is it's good that people agree, and there was no collusion. And secondly, that there's no bad thing in reinforcing messages. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Um, but the context is there, and the context is, depending upon how one wants to look at it, either a wonderful, amazing opportunity for a sector that has, for decades, not received the investment that it actually required, or one looks at it as literally Armageddon. We talked about the last century being the, oil, the, the century of oil. I remember as it was turning the century, people said it would be the century of water. And now people talk about it being the century of food. But of course, food and water are exactly the same thing. It's just that we need soils and we need weather to go with it. But this really is the challenge. Um, I don't think it's the challenge of a lifetime. I think it's a challenge of many lifetimes. But the reality is, as he says, he pressed the button, that business as usual won't get us across the line. Now, I've been having a lot of conversations recently, not only with, with, with countries and NGOs and CSOs, but also with big food, with the industry. And what is coming and becoming even more clear to them is that the conversation around sustainable agriculture used to be one about niche marketing, products, margins. As I said last year at an international conference in London, uh, what I mean by sustainability is sustainability of your actual business. Because it is truly a global food system. What is being produced in one place is now being consumed in another. And so the impact in one country flows through everywhere. And the impact of climate change on that reality is a global issue. It is a global target that we face. And no one country, and no one company, and no one organization can tackle it on their own. It is just the simple reality. And when you start looking at these pictures, I, I, I've become known very well in the World Bank for being Mr. Doom and Gloom. But I, as an ex-commodities trader, I just look at numbers. And the numbers tell you the picture. And the picture is that we have to change. And business as usual will not get us there. But equally, uh, we are the most affected sector 
to the changing climate. We are the most vulnerable. We're currently the least, arguably, able to adapt. We're also, I would contend, 20 years behind the curve. The other sectors and the other industries moved. So my question often becomes, what is the electric car of agriculture? Because business as usual for what people describe as the two degree world, which is an emissions level in the region of 21 to 22 gigatons, is if we continue business as usual in agricultural production on the planet into 2050, according to, 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 to Tim's work at WRI and others, we become 70% of global emissions. Well, that's already a problem because it's those emissions that are causing the change in the weather patterns that are impacting our sector. So we've also got a job to do in delivering on that while still trying to feed 9 billion people. So the challenge is, how do we treble food production in Africa? Because Africa will be feeding large chunks of the rest of the planet. It already is. Producers in Malawi, near the long way, I remember a couple of years ago seeing producing pigeon peas. They don't consume pigeon peas. I tracked this down, and it was being exported to India. The next year, they said, oh, um, we're not exporting the pigeon peas anymore. I said, oh, the business went bad. No, we're exporting dal. We process it locally, and we ship it. The world as we knew it is no longer the world as it will be. Now, I like to think positively, and maybe that's a character type, but this is an amazing opportunity which we're actually facing. So what are those actual challenges? And I think the secretary laid them out. And there's no great surprise that he did, because the secretary was actually talking about this in 2009 in Copenhagen. We have to dramatically increase our production. And no, it's not easy to get to a number, because of things like conversion factors and how many proteins are people actually going to want to consume. And let's remember, there's a huge protein gap. I often hear the conversation becoming very polarized around, well, you know, we can't have protein consumption at the levels that we see in OECD countries. But those levels are going down. But if you are emerging from poverty in India or in China, the first thing you want to do is diversify your diet. And in actual fact, one in five children in the Mekong Delta, under five, is malnourished. It is the rice basket of the world. In 2011, Vietnam made $3.2 billion from the export of rice. They spent $4 billion importing feed. The dynamics and the underlying pieces have changed. And this is the challenge that we need to meet. The challenge for us as a community is that we don't actually have an approach to that. And the reason that the bank has become uh, so vocal with this is a realization of the challenge that we face. Secondly, we have a leader, Dr. Kim, who uh, is a numbers person. Who, when he saw the four degree report that, that we did with the Potsdam Institute, he said, great, you have literally terrified me. Now, what are you going to do about it? And this is of someone who wants answers and doesn't want problems. So at the bank, um, walking the talk, all of the sectors of the bank will now be taking climate change and applying the climate lens. We are now defining what that climate lens looks like. In agriculture, we, we had started moving in this space. But we started moving in terms of, really in terms of resilience and in terms of adaptation. We hadn't yet really been moving in the emissions space. And this is a space that we need to move. And that comes down to metrics and targets. Um, you know, USAID have the same thing. When a doctor's running the shop, they get really specific about numbers. And you kind of got to deliver on them. And certainly in the World Bank, it's exactly, exactly the same pattern. Uh, and so part of the other piece was it's OK for the bank to do it, but what is the bank? The bank is a very small piece. This is a $5.3 trillion a year industry. The bank lends somewhere in the region of $8 to $10 billion. So how relevant is the bank in a much bigger context? And the good news was that there was already an ongoing conversation in various different places on the planet. And parts of those conversations, in actual fact, were going on in this country, being led by USDA and others, and specifically by the Secretary, about what will it take? What will it take for us to change? What will it take for us to feed 9 billion people, but do it in a way that means that we won't have food price spikes, 
and do it in a way that means we will not become the largest emitter on the planet. How do we do it? The reality is we don't have all the answers. But if we actually work together, we can find some of those. The reality is that it is not going to be development institutions alone. It won't be governments alone. It won't be companies alone. We have to bring everyone together in a big tent. And that is no, you know, that is no easy thing. And Jonathan Schreier is sitting here today and introduced us. Uh, these are groupings uh, and, and different interest groups. And some of them are not actually agreeing with each other all the time. But we have to identify that common space. And the good news is that certainly it's a very different conversation today than it was even 16 months ago. Um, and so we have this piece, which is the Alliance on Climate Smart Agriculture is a global movement. Um, USAID have been heavily involved in those discussions. And this is the piece that we're looking to work with others to move forwards. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Well, let's turn now to Jerry Glover. Uh, Jerry is Senior Advisor for Sustainable Agricultural Systems here at USAID and a <clears throat> National Geographic Society Explorer, which I think is somewhere up there near Peace Corps Volunteer, uh, Jerry. Not quite as daring. <laughs> But I think the important thing is that Jerry is a real systems thinker uh, in the agency. And what I'd like to know, Jerry, is where is your systems thinking taking you these days in the context of Feed the Future? Well, really, uh, when, we, uh, when I was asked to summarize some of the Feed the Future actions on climate smart agriculture, I went to our website and just browsed through it. And uh, there is a website, so there's a lot of technical detail out there. And I thought rather than do that, I would just tell some of the stories of what we do through uh, the, the on-the-ground activities of this farmer from western Malawi, Rhoda Mignana, who's shown here in the picture with her granddaughter, Ratifa. And a big lesson, I think, that comes out of this is that climate-smart agriculture is not just a practice or tool that you plop down on the ground. It's a process, and often it takes a long time. The regions in which we work often face many challenges that make that process even longer. Uh, some 20 years ago, Rhoda's husband died, and she was suddenly left with the responsibility of feeding the seven members of her family, roughly a hectare of land, and providing all the financial income. She, this field that she's sitting in in this photo was essentially unproductive. The land had been degraded, nutrients had m mined. She was only getting roughly three bags of maize from that field, not nearly enough to support her family. What she did really is embark on a long process of land rehabilitation, land restoration, increased productivity, and a lot of her approaches fit very well within our concept of sustainable intensification. We have roughly three different components to sustainable intensification that I think Rhoda really exemplifies. Now remember, I'm saying she started this some 20 years ago. That's before climate change had really hit our awareness in terms of action on the ground. It was still a concept for the future. So I just want to point out, you know, this is a long-term process and we face many challenges even before we get to climate change that we see in areas such as Kenya, uh, particularly around land degradation. Now, the first thing we often think about when we uh, address uh, research and sustainable intensification to help with climate uh, adaptation and mitigation is certainly improve varieties of crops, improve breeds of livestock. Not shown in this photo, uh, are the livestock that Rhoda raises. She has introduced improved breeds of livestock uh, that fit very well within this system uh, that she has now. Introduction of drought and heat tolerance in the major crops, maize for instance. Uh, the pest and disease pressures uh, that we can improve resistance and tolerance to, increase nutrient use efficiency, and even fur a bit further out, increasing the photosynthetic efficiency of crops like wheat, 
uh, changing the uh, carbon assimilation pathways in crops like rice so that we're now talking about a C4 rice, a warm season rice, and uh, even perennializing some of the major grain crops. I was at a meeting last week where some of the scientists working on this say now these things are measured in months from, being, from coming to fruition rather than years. So uh, we are working heavily on that. Uh, USAID, I'm proud to say, is involved in that uh, across the board. Rhoda has used some improved maize varieties to boost her yields in recent years. And so she's also involved in that type of genetic intensification, essentially getting more crop yields per unit land area. But it's not just about crop yields. It's also about socioeconomic intensification. And this is really where the robust nature of climate smart agriculture comes in. It has to do with education, uh, connection to extension services. A well-informed, well-educated farmer is much more able to make the right decisions in the face of the types of changes we're expecting than someone without those links and without that educational support merely with improved crop varieties. Uh, so USAID in many of our regions focuses heavily on institutional and human capacity development to support that resilience that we're trying to build in over the long term to climate smart agriculture. It's multi-generational and we, and we see this on Rhoda's farm. She was as focused on educating her children providing enough money for school fees as she was on food security because she knew that her children needed opportunities to, to get off the farm or for those that were staying on the farm, they needed an education to maintain and increase the productivity of the farm. That's where I think the real resilience for the future will come in. Uh, Molly and Mark talked about the uncertainties. The best insurance against uncertainties is a well-educated, well-prepared um, citizenry that's well-linked to their neighbors, well-linked to their universities, and so on. The last part is one of my favorite uh, aspects of sustainable intensification, and that's ecological intensification. And by that, I mean developing agricultural systems that are more effective at capturing sunlight, better able to capture the rainfall when it hits the soil, it soaks in and is stored in the soil, released to the plants, making better use of what's on the farm, not just on the cropped area, but on the non-cropped area as well. Taking advantage of uh, the different enterprises on the farm, not just crops, but livestock, the shrubs and the trees. A focus, a big focus on nutrient cycling, making sure that the nutrients that are removed from the farm are somehow replaced back onto the farm field, whether from using trees to mine deeper in the soil, bringing it to the surface, or bringing from non-cropped areas or recycling from the urban centers where the food is uh, sold. The use of intercrops and rotations, uh, and looking at really the whole farm rather than just a, com a component of the farm or a com commodity of the farm, taking the, the much fuller picture. We're really embedding, I believe, these ideas into our research and development programs taking a much more systems approach. And one of the areas that I'm uh, happy to see moving forward is a much greater understanding of what's going on below ground. Now, you know, there's a lot of models out there. I used Rhoda's example. I had to because Dennis Garrity, World Agroforestry Center, uh, is moderating. So I had to include this, uh, this farm that uses agroforestry. What you're seeing is a soil profile below Rhoda and her granddaughter showing the exposed tree roots. That tree that she's leaning up against is a leguminous tree. It supplies nitrogen to the, uh, the maize and helps improve maize yields. It also improves the soil below ground. So it's a full system above ground and below ground. And so that's just one strategy of many that we can help put together. It's not a single strategy. It's not a one time only application of of this type of interaction and, and integration. It's a long process, often, as Mark pointed out, intergenerational. Okay, well, thank you, Jerry. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, I, I should point out, I should point out, uh, when I went on that farm, I didn't know the full history of it. By the end of the two days, I'd been there a couple of days, 
So how did she put all this together? Well, she's the recipient of a USAID-funded project uh, over 15 years ago, implemented by the World Agroforestry Center, uh, partnering with the local university and the extension services. So this is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Putting this together re sometimes requires long periods of time, but we have to keep that going. Great, thank you, Jerry. And I think I'll try to build on a few of the things that you've said and also on Mark's uh, description about the global alliance that's emerging. For indeed, um, uh, the um, NAPAD, the New Partnership for Africa's Development, a few weeks ago convened an all-Africa meeting and uh, they assembled representation from the uh, CADEP countries, the regional economic commissions, the uh, major um, research organizations like FARA and the CGIAR. And in the context of that set of workshops um, in, held in Nairobi, um, they looked at the urgency that, uh, Molly, you were pointing out uh, as far as climate change, which is actually being observed, it's being felt in Africa throughout the continent. And they wanted to examine a couple of things. One, what was climate smart agriculture in the context of Africa, uniquely, and what to do urgently to move things forward? And so I'd like to um, really look at that issue. Um, most of us, from the global perspective, see um, uh, climate smart agriculture in terms of the common definition of the triple win. Um, that is increasing productivity and food security along with resilience, along with reduced greenhouse gas emissions. And that's the commonly accepted definition. But during that meeting, um, led by NAPAD, um, in the African context, it was interpreted a little differently. Uh, for after all, we're aware that Africa contributes very little to the problem, but is suffering most from the, um, the, uh, the, the dramatic changes that are occurring. So, um, in the African context, um, it's a matter of looking at the weights by which you would uh, weight the, the triple win indicators, and, and, and mitigation would be uh, far lower. Not insignificant, but a co-benefit to the other uh, two, which are the major concerns of developing countries. Well, in the end, um, the, um, the, the meeting concluded um, by looking at um, how things could move forward urgently. And it was quite an exciting meeting, one of the most that I've been uh, uh, attending in many years, because it established a very clear common vision for the region in generating large-scale action in climate smart agriculture. And it was agreed to provoke a challenge to the continent and all of the potential participating countries and institutions to urgently reach 25 million farmers uh, with climate smart agricultural practices by the year 2025. And I think uh, right now, currently a campaign is being developed to focus on achieving this 25 by 25 goal, and CADEP is reaching out to mobilize on it, uh, and we're going to be seeing this concept put forward to the African heads of state next month at their summit focused on agriculture. So it's really moving quickly. And um, I think the, the effort has a pretty clear goal. Um, it's measurable because we're talking about uh, 25 million farmers practicing at least one new climate smart agricultural practice in the next decade. And it's got um, a solid scientific basis and an emerging process. So this is pretty interesting. Um, and it's got all Africa leadership through the Africa Union, uh, NAPAD. The, the thing is, 25 million farmers is about a quarter of the total farmers in Africa. Um, the logic there was looking at the tipping point. When you've reached a quarter of the farmers, um, it looks pretty probable that things could move very rapidly to the remaining uh, farmers. So that is the story right now about an alliance that is developing and linking closely with the Global Alliance Mark, as you know. Um, and providing, I think, momentum to that as well, as well. Now, in choosing the appropriate practices for climate smart agriculture, now that's a complex deal. We have to look at all of the different uh, complexities and diversities of the farming systems of Africa and um, evolve processes by which stakeholders would select priority practices for their farming system. 
Work is being done, particularly a major effort within the CGIAR um, uh, climate change research programs, to amass a tremendous body of data on um, the triple win indicators uh, so that ratings and prioritization can be done scientifically. But ultimately, it will involve expert knowledge and the choices that are made at the local level. But this is an example for the maize mixed farming system, one of the major ones in, on the continent, uh, comparing different types of practices in terms of the triple win. Well, the thing is, prospective practices that come up quite strongly in terms of um, green light um, in the triple win tend to be such as conservation farming practices uh, with uh, minimum zero tillage um, and various types of agroforestry practices. Uh, this idea of incorporating trees into cropping systems um, is uh, coming up as a major opportunity for meeting the triple win, uh, building on what farmers are already doing in many countries, uh, such as here in Zambia, where um, a major national program is scaling up the phytherbia trees, same tree as Rhoda has on her farm, uh, uh, Jerry, uh, to hundreds of thousands of farmers uh, practicing conservation tillage. Likewise, um, uh, the um, farmers in Zambia uh, farming maize uh, under um, f what look like forests of, of, of phytherbia trees provides a model and indeed a vision of the future uh, whereby trees such as these, which are so compatible with cropping systems, in fact, you'll notice they have no leaves on them. They are dormant during the wet season. African farmers recognized this generations ago and they see this and there are millions of farmers across the continent that use these trees. It behooves us to look at these kind of compatible combinations. And then there are the fast growing nitrogen fixing trees such as Gliricidia introduced from Central America which is also now grown across the continent by uh, maize and, and other farmers. Indeed, African farmers have shown us the way to successfully integrate trees into cropping systems something that Western agriculture certainly has not uh, had a bead on in the past, but could learn a lot from what is happening in the tropics and particularly in Africa. For indeed, um, currently, the farmers in Niger, over 1.2 million of them, have absolutely transformed their landscapes, over 5 million hectares, with this carpet of, um, of trees, again, Phytherbia trees, um, in their sorghum and millet fields, giving you a mass model of how this kind of a tree-based cropping system with livestock can evolve in a integrated way. So therefore, um, the World Bank, Mark, as well as USAID, many projects I know are now gearing up to embed these types of farmer-managed natural regeneration systems into their programs in the Sahel, and it's becoming a Sahelian-wide Great Green Wall movement of grassroots involvement in the development of these systems throughout the region. Very exciting. Well, the uh, agriculture ministers got together a couple of years ago um, and issued a call for action amongst the um, African countries. This is the um, cover of the uh, booklet that they released for that meeting and uh, endorsed and highlighted the concepts of evergreen agriculture in the process. Currently, about 17 countries are engaged in scaling up uh, evergreen agriculture. That is supposed to be Africa. It looked like the rest has disappeared in this particular <laughs> configuration. Different systems for different farming uh, conditions, but um, throughout the continent now, a major approach. What we need to do is work harder to support those um, countries and the many organizations that are involved in um, embedding uh, programming on evergreen agriculture into their, um, into their projects. And therefore, um, a global partnership on evergreen agriculture has evolved to reach out to governments, um, the NGO sector, and these other communities to build technical capacity for this kind of a visionary transformation. So in conclusion, we are finding that um, the approach to evergreen agriculture has taken root in Africa widely. 
Uh, millions of smallholders are adopting effective land regenerations based on these principles. Many nations are working to create the policy and institutional underpinning for this kind of change. And USAID could be instrumental in uh, continuing to expand its efforts <coughs> to um, look at this kind of uh, agricultural system, which is unconventional for most folks uh, in the uh, agronomic sciences, but now is beginning to take hold. The African Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance that I talked about um, could provide a tremendous platform for the development of and extension of common efforts across the continent to reach 25 million farmers. And I hope you'll keep, uh, keep in touch uh, after the Heads of State Summit. We shall see the reaction of African leaders to the concept and whether, Jerry, it will be embedded into the next 10 years <coughs> of the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program. So with that, um, let us close. And um, I believe we have very little time left. <laughs> Five minutes. Uh, you know, the secretary did take some of our time, didn't he? But um, let's open up the floor for um, questions. And could you wave? Could you wave? Because it's a little hard to see, from, see your hands from up here. But maybe Laura could help identify um, questions to any or all of the panel members. There's one over here on this. Yeah. Or is that the audio-visual guy? Okay. No. Oh. <laughs> uh, Philippe Mathieu from Haiti, Projet Avancé. Uh, I want to know how to deal with the problem of intercropping in front of usually a model where you have monocropping. And it is a big challenge for our agriculture in the south. And I believe the uh, intercropping and the fact to, of utilization of the uh, intercropping is really important for facing climate change and also to have evergreen agriculture and also to um, you know, to uh, have less risk concerning the economic uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Jerry, hold that, um, and, and we'll, we'll take uh, additional interjections <coughs> and then maybe make one final round of the panel. I think Todd is here. Uh, hi, uh, hi uh, Todd Crosby from uh, Senegal. Yeah, Gen Day program, but uh, we've been working a lot with uh, climate smart agriculture across the Senegal portfolio. So, one of the things I want was going to ask you is how do you uh, how do you reconcile the impact or the emphasis on technologies and engaging uh, private sector and um, industrial some some industrial players with uh, a type of agriculture that is ultimately process oriented in kind of long term, um, how do, how do you uh, integrate those two? Mm -hmm. okay. Additional? Mm -hmm. Whoa. Whoa. That was another question. <laughs> uh, any, there's, a, there's a hand here. Yeah. Maybe. You. Thank you. Uh, P.V. Sundaresh for uh, Africa Bureau, uh, USA. Uh, I think we talked a lot about on-farm activities, and I would like to hear panel's thought on post-harvest losses and how do we start minimizing. <coughs> I think that kind of discussion tends to get uh, sidelined. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, good. So I think we'll have to stop now, and let me ask uh, Jerry if you could address on, the intercropping. On question. the intercropping, that is a very important point. Many of the farmers that we work with have limited land area, an acre or a hectare or less. Rhoda, for example, did not want to do a rotation. She didn't want to take some of her field out of maize production. She wanted to grow maize every year. The only way you can do that and grow other crops, such as legumes, is through intercropping. She actually used very successfully intercropping of uh, pigeon peas and groundnuts uh, in those initial years to restore her soil. Mm -hmm. Now with the maize tree 
in her cropping, she can get tremendous yields. And by the way, she raised the land's productivity from three bags from that field to 45 bags mm -hmm. through this uh, successional intercropping, eventually reaching to maize and, and agroforestry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it is important, extremely. Good, good. And the question um, on the uh, long-term uh, interactions with industrial agriculture or, or uh, perhaps mechanized agriculture, um, I think probably what you're driving at is that um, there will need to be an accommodation um, in, in agricultural systems for the incorporation of trees, obviously, and new, new ways of um, configuring densities and management strategies for trees, taking a lot of what farmers are actually doing as a basis, starting from there, to look at how management can be compatible with mechanized cropping systems as they are already with um, uh, those systems in Zambia where the commercial farmers are using uh, this, this type of agriculture. So it's, it's a major and a very interesting and important research issue. Now, I think uh, the last was on the post-harvest. Um, would you like to? Yeah, Molly? I'm the lead author on a USDA report, um, which is going to be on global food security, climate change, and the US food system. And one of the, we are really seeing how incredibly important post-harvest loss is not only on the farm, but also off the farm. Off mm -hmm. the farm can really help us meet that doubling of the food requirement by yes. pounding down those, those losses. And you know, the developed countries have waste more food after it reaches the house than is lost in the developing countries. I mean, there's significant, and we are in that report, we will highlight research needs, and this is a huge one, is how to communicate in the, in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Mark? Just, just that, going back to the, the second yeah. question, because I, I just wanted to interpret something into it that wasn't actually there. <laughs> was, was, but it, is how does industry interact with a long-term sector like this and the change? And the conversation, that I'm, this is my interpretation, but the, the issue here is, uh, in the short term, that's their quarterly earnings. That's managing volatility. In the medium term, this is about cost structures. If they don't get down the supply chains, their cost structures fundamentally change. And ultimately, what's really driving and is the emerging piece in this now is equity markets. Because long-term money, not the overnight trading, but the long-term money, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, are looking for companies and areas of investment that give them two things. One, a business is going to have a good return. That is food. We're going to have more people. They're going to consume more stuff. And secondly, how good are you at managing your business in risk and in the face of climate? And I spend a lot of time now bumping into equity analysts who are looking at big food companies on specifically that point. What that is starting to drive is equity prices. And the conversations I've been having with CEOs, that moves them. Because they're only there for five to six years, but the equity price is there every morning. Mm. Well, I see we're actually out of time now, and so uh, I want to thank my fellow panel, panel members for such a well-coordinated group of presentations. <laughs>